We, as human beings, easily get caught up in our daily lives. Lives that move with an ever-quickening pace in movement, communication, and technology. We can be unaware that life is in fact all around us. Um, so, all right, so what are the plans for this weekend? When we travel from one place to another, our need to get somewhere quickly often takes precedence over taking in the environment. We might never stop and see a wildflower, observe the turn of a bird, or watch the crops waving in a field. At home, we might have a little bit of nature to call our own. Even then, we can still see only a part of what's really there. For instance, many of us are unaware that there are other creatures right beneath our feet that spend most of their lives far from our sight. One such creature came back to visit us in May of 2004, an insect known as the periodical cicada the cicadas of Brood 10. Their story is one of a unique life cycle on a 17-year clock. It's the story of how, in a few months' time, they were a natural force of sight and sound that was hard to ignore, and a story of how studying these insects may help us to learn more about nature and its mechanisms. This is the Cicada Earth. The story of this fascinating life cycle begins in the summer of 1987. Then, Newly born insects, known as periodical cicadas, genus Magicicada, hatched in the branches of trees. These cicadas, from the brood, known as Brood 10, burrowed into the soil at the beginning of a 17-year cycle of life. The cicada nymphs descended to build feeding chambers to serve as homes, 6 to 12 inches below the surface. One chamber or tunnel for each nymph. There, they started to feed off the xylem fluids in the root system of a tree. The xylem provided them with water, amino acids, and minerals to sustain life. As they continued to feed, they grew through stages known as instars. Their form changed from soft, whitish, and almost translucent to an exoskeleton with a brownish cast. A cicada might move up and down over time in its chamber, but one cicada will never enter another's chamber. Any accidental entry is quickly closed off. Sometime in the last seven or eight years, they moved up to four to eight inches from the surface. Then, one evening, in May of 2004, as darkness came and the conditions were just right, a cicada started digging towards the surface. Using its claw-like front appendages to dig, a hole approximately one-half inch in diameter appeared in the ground. Soon, a single cicada nymph found open air.
Before long, more and more began to emerge from their holes. Over the course of the next few weeks, cicadas covered areas of habitat in numbers as high as a million and a half per acre. Those that didn't come out of a hole flush with the ground created mud turrets and emerged out of those. Periodical cicadas have been the source of study for a long time. Their unique lifestyle and survival strategy continues to be researched. One of the most important questions is how the cicada knows it's time to emerge. How do they judge 17 years? And how do they know just the right moment of the year to emerge? Keith Clay, a professor and research scientist at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, is one of the leading experts on periodical cicadas. How do cicadas know to emerge after 17 years is an interesting question. And we don't really know what the answer is, but some experimental work that's been done in uh, nursery stock in large pots that were put into artificial growth chambers where they are able to crank up uh, the the speed of season to season changes uh, revealed that cicadas emerged after 17 cycles that were each significantly shorter than a year. So it's not the 17 years per se, but it's rather 17 seasons. And apparently they are counting. They're, they're counting the number of uh, seasons. And how exactly they do that, what's going on in a cicada brain, uh, we don't know, but they're, they're pretty good at it. They can count. And then during that 17th year, the signal for them to come out of the ground is soil temperature. When it's about um, 64 degrees Fahrenheit, they will emerge. So they count to 17 and then they wait until the temperature is right. The periodical cicada is found only in eastern North America. Scientists have separated them by cycle, 13 or 17 years, and by broods within the cycles. Brood 10 is one of 12 17-year cicada broods. Periodical cicadas can be found as far west as Kansas and as far south as Texas. Time and place are important factors in brood distribution. Glaciers covered uh, much of North America up until 10 or 12,000 years ago, and clearly cicadas by being specialized on woody plants have moved north with the the glacial retreat uh, but further south um, in the southeastern united states the southern appalachians was never glaciated and cicadas uh, presumably persisted and thrived uh, during that period of time and then were able to recolonize since then but it does raise the interesting question, all these broods and the geographical distributions of these individual broods has evolved since the retreat of the glaciers. And, and how that happened is subject to a lot of debate without any clear answers. Yeah, if you look at a map of the distribution of cicadas, and we've been talking about brood 10, which emerged in 2004 and 2021, but there are many other cicada broods, and they differ from each other in two ways. One is um, the years that they emerge. It's not the same schedule. It's every 17 years, but um, maybe in 2002 or 2008 or what have you. The other thing that differs is the geographical distribution. These broods do not overlap with each other. They tend to have pretty sharp divisions between them. So brood 10 
petered out in um, eastern Illinois and didn't really get any further west, but it's replaced by another brood. The broods that are most successful are concentrated and all coming out on the same time. These overlapping areas don't seem to be as successful and over time have basically gone extinct. In the 17-year cicadas of brood 10, three morphologically distinct species exist. Septendesium, Cassini, and Septendecula. The 17-year brood 10 of 2004 can be found in a wide geographic area stretching from as far east as New York to as far west as Illinois and as far south as Georgia. Areas in and around Bloomington, Indiana, Baltimore, Maryland, and Cincinnati, Ohio were said to have had incredible concentrations of cicadas. Once out of the ground, the cicadas began a mission of renewing themselves that would continue for the next four to six weeks. The nymphs began to search for the nearest vertical surface to climb and gain a foothold. Cicadas prefer woody plants trees and shrubs. However, you could find them on just about any vertical surface, walls, gravestones, fences, even people. Some climbed higher than others, but they all had one objective, finding a place in which to transform themselves into adults. This period is known as molting or echidesis, it can take as little as 20 minutes to shed their nymph stage exoskeleton. This is the most crucial time in cicada development and, for us, the most beautiful to observe. At first, the adult body can be seen flexing under the shell. Soon, the dorsal side of the body begins to open, like the unzipping of a winter coat. After a period of pushing out, a ballet is performed with their former self. The cicada flips over, using the old body as an anchor. Over the next few hours, the new, ghostly white insects will change even more. The wings start out resembling stub-like aircraft canards, but will expand to full size. The coloring will also change as the new exoskeleton hardens to a blackish hue with orange veined wings. Once the transformation is complete, the discarded exoskeleton vessel that for so long contained the cicada's body can still be seen dutifully anchored. Eventually, these shells fall to the ground where they break down and provide nutrients to the soil. A cicada emergence brings a question to many people. Are they dangerous? The cicada cannot harm anyone directly. It has no bite or sting or physical armor. They can do little to defend themselves from attack. The males can emit a loud, defensive buzzing noise that affects some potential predators. They have, in fact, been called predator foolhardy in nature. A wide variety of mammals, 
birds, reptiles, and arthropods find the cicadas an easy meal. This is especially true when they are still on the ground in the nymph stage or while molting. Many predators will gorge themselves to the point of being sick. With so many predators eating so many at a time and being virtually defenseless, how have they not been eaten into extinction? Another leading cicada expert, entomologist Jean Kritsky from the College of Mount St. Joseph in Cincinnati, Ohio, tells us how. Well, it turns out the periodical cicada life cycle is tied into a process called predator satiation, which is a big word to say that basically they come out in such numbers that all the birds, squirrels, cats, and people can eat all the cicadas they want and they there still is enough to reproduce the next generation. I like to think of it as what would happen if you walked outside and you found the world being inundated by flying Hershey's Kisses. The first thing you do is eat so many, but you can eat too much chocolate. And when you're done with that, you're tired of eating chocolate. You may not want to eat chocolate for a while. The same thing happens with the squirrels, the birds, the cats, the dogs, and the people. And that's how they survive. The other natural enemy the cicadas have is a pathogenic fungus called Massosipora cicadina. It tracks them generation to generation. Immune from the 17-year life cycle, it waits in the soil for the next emergence. It starts as an infection at the tip of the abdomen and spreads. It will either cripple the reproductive process or lead to death. Cicada mortality can also be caused by an individual just never being able to extricate itself from the exoskeleton. They can also be crippled if the wings fail to properly expand. This may be caused by the wings drying too quickly, crowding of other cicadas, or the use of lawn chemicals. Without the ability to fly, they are limited to staying in a single area or roaming on the ground where they can likely get eaten. If the process goes well, the adult cicada will be ready to begin finding a mate and passing its genes on to the next generation. This occurs five to 18 days after emergence. The males will congregate in large numbers on branches that are in bright sunlight. They produce songs in synchronous chorus. While we may not perceive them, all three species have distinct songs. These songs attract females to a given area to mate. The sound of an individual male is made by a set of ridged membranes known as timbals found on the first abdominal segment. At its most intense, a chorus of cicadas may produce a sound level of 100 decibels. This made them lawbreakers in many cities by exceeding noise ordinances. One of the species, Magicicada septendecula, made a sound akin to flying saucers of 1950s science fiction movies. Chorus centers may move and change during an emergence. Sometimes more than one species will form a chorus that just increases the overall volume. For some people living in these areas, the din could be either fascinating or very maddening. As a female approaches a male, she will produce timed wing flicks in response to the male call. Males can perceive the wing flick both acoustically and visually. John Cooley, a research scientist from the University of Connecticut and leading cicada expert, visited Indiana during the 2004 emergence. Professor Keith Clay led him in to a quarry in Monroe County where there were a lot of cicadas. There, Cooley attempted to simulate the three male calls and the female wing flick sound. 
He did this with an ordinary, toggled light switch. It produced good results. The light switch certainly had some males turned on, but they understandably became confused when no female was near the sound. Now see, he's just gonna walk up there and try to sneak one. Mm -hmm. The trick is to get him to start calling under these circumstances. He's gonna walk right up there and have a look. But now the, that whistling sound, that's the male. Yep, and that's what I got here. This but, is a male. Um, and the, wing, the switch is playing female in this game. I'm just pretending I'm another male oh, and I've got a female. Oh yeah, no, he'll try to horn in on that. He's okay. obviously paying attention to what's going on there. But when they're playing sneak like that, they don't always call. Mm -hmm. They're just playing sneak. He's gonna let the other male do all the work and he's mm -hmm. just gonna walk up and get the female. Then if I'm playing that game and I stop, uh, sooner or later he'll give it a shot. He gets right up to it, then he goes <whistles> One flick at the end, then he goes to court three. Court two. Court three. Genitalia come out. They rotate. And he's he making it. Wait a minute, what is this? <laughs> Yes, he's court three. So the genitalia are out and rotating. Like many insects, they have to rotate their genitalia to mate. Wait a minute! <laughs> so, now we have a thoroughly confused male. He's walking around trying to uh, engage his genitalia in anything he can find. Uh, so that's it. That was the whole thing right there. With more than a light switch to mate with, here we see a female that has found a male. They form a duet of sounds as they approach each other with the calls and the wing flick. Then they mate. After mating, periodical cicada females will lay eggs. To do this, they will use a sharp pointed structure at the end of their body known as an ovipositor. The ovipositor slices into tree branches, forming slits wide enough to lay eggs dispensed from the ovipositor. The number of eggs laid can vary from species to species, but several dozen eggs to several hundred can be laid in one branch. Each female can lay up to 400 eggs in each of 40 or 50 locations. Each species generally prefers its own type of tree for a habitat. Decula prefers hickory and walnut, cassini, ash, elm, oaks, and shrubs. Decium is less particular, preferring mature trees in upland forest canopies. There are some environmental side effects to the trees cicadas lay their eggs in. Newly hatched nymphs, once underground, immediately start feeding on xylem in tree roots. This may retard tree growth. Also, pathogens harmful to plant life may pass from the cicadas to the tree or bush. These effects on the forest habitat are still being studied. One side effect of cicada egg laying in trees is what is known as tree flagging. Uh, tree flagging is a dramatic symptom of attack uh, by cicadas. When the female lays her eggs in, in young twigs, uh, typically pencil size diameter twigs, it causes a, a weakness, a deformation of the twig, and they're prone to snapping in high winds or heavy rains or what have you. And typically, rather than breaking off completely, they just kind of fall and hang straight down. The vascular system is disrupted, so they're starved of water and nutrients, and they gradually turn brown and, and die. And uh, you could see 
all over, trees that had been heavily attacked would just be covered with these so-called flags um, drooping down. Uh, but a year later they were gone and there was no apparent impact. While it may seem that cicadas only have negative effects on their host trees, they do provide a positive in the form of a nutrient pulse. Uh, a nutrient pulse is a sudden input into the system of a rich source of nutrients. Uh, we're familiar with you know, fertilizing your lawn or, or a cornfield or something, and it results in a burst of growth. Uh, one possible impact of cicadas on forest communities is that they represent, or at least their dead bodies represent, a tremendous pulse of nutrients back into the forest system. Um, they've slowly accumulated parasitized nutrients from the trees over this 17-year period. They emerge, the adults are around for uh, a few weeks, and then they all die. And all those bodies, at least the ones that aren't eaten, uh, drop to the ground and, and rot. Uh, during the summer of 2004, when this stage occurred, the atmosphere in many areas of Bloomington was just permeated with the smell of um, dead and decaying cicadas. It was kind of interesting. Uh, but that was gradually leaking, percolating down into the soil where the plants uh, glommed onto those resources uh, quite happily. Periodical cicadas of all broods have existed for around 1.8 million years. They have intrigued, entertained, and even annoyed people for over a recorded 300 years. They have been the subject of much observation and study. In fact, accounts of them in North America go back as far as 1633. Seventeen forty nine found noted African American Benjamin Banneker making an accounting of Brood Ten. Like many do, even to this day, he mistakenly referred to them as locusts. The first great locust year that I can remember was seventeen forty nine. I was about seventeen years of age when thousands of them came and was creeping up the trees and bushes. I then imagined they came to eat and destroy the fruit of the earth and would occasion a famine in the land. The famous naturalist Charles Darwin had an interest in periodical cicadas. He carried on a correspondence with the state entomologist of Illinois, Benjamin Walsh. They debated whether or not 13 and 17 year cicadas were of the same species. That same year, a 17- and 13-year brood emerged together. This happens only once every 221 years. Darwin was studying cicadas in southern Brazil at the time. While those were a different species from the periodicals in America, he made an observation that could equally be said of them as well. As there is so much rivalry between the males, it is probable that the females not only discover them by the sounds emitted, but that, like female birds, they are excited or allured by the male with the most attractive voice. In 1902, President Theodore Roosevelt, one of the most boisterous orators in American history, was almost drowned out by Brood 10 while giving his Memorial Day address. On this day, the 30th of May, we call to mind the death of those who died that the nation might live, who wagered all that life holds dear for the great prize of death in battle. 1936 found another Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, in the White House. The United States government produced a film documenting Brood 10's emergence that year.
It was excellent in detail for its time, and also mentioned this interesting legend. Out near the tip of the wing, note the W, commonly believed to be a foreboding of war. This is on every cicada, and as each year there is usually a war somewhere, the belief persists. The 1970 Brood 10 emergence got everyone's attention at Princeton University's graduation. Like the cicadas, another famous singer, Bob Dylan, was there. He was to receive an honorary degree. However, he didn't appreciate the music of the Brood 10 band and retreated to his car before getting the degree. He was eventually coaxed out of his car and came back to the ceremony. It made such an impression upon him that he wrote a song about it, Day of the Locusts. Oh, the benches were stained with tears and perspiration. The birdies were flying from tree to tree. There was little to say, there was no conversation. As I step to the stage to pick up my degree, and the locust sang off in the distance. Yeah, the locust sang such a sweet melody. Oh, the locust sang off in the distance. Yeah, the locust sang, and they were singing for me. Another song caught the attention of Cincinnati, Ohio radio listeners during the cicada emergence of 1987. DJs at radio station WEBN decided to write a parody of a jingle for the popular Snappy Tomato pizza chain. They created Snappy Cicada Pizza. While the Snappy Tomato Pizza people never made a cicada-flavored pizza, their sales did go up in 1987. Snap, snap, snappy cicada pizza. Ooh. We make our pizza with our authentic crunchy breed. Ooh, snappy cicada pizza. We hand-strip the wings, ditching the parts we don't need. Snappy cicada pizza, we choose the freshest cicadas in town. When we run out, we pull more from the ground. Three. Snap, snap, snappy cicada pizza. Ooh. Tree delivery. As part of the fun, in 2004, some people even enjoyed eating cicadas. The Friday Zone a children's program produced by PBS station WTIU in Bloomington, Indiana, showed just that. While the children on the show were willing to take a bite out of some cicadas, host Echo Chappelle wasn't quite as willing. Why don't you guys do it together? Okay. okay. Oh my gosh, I don't okay, think I can do it. You can. Okay. Put it. Put it. <gasps> no, no, no. I can't. I won't do it. I can't. I'll do take it, it then. Okay. <laughs> Brood 10 has been more than historically or socially observed. It has also been the lure of serious scientific study in a number of disciplines as diverse as biology, geography, and anthropology. Some look at them from their place in the insect world and how they compare to close relatives like leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, and fulgaroids. Others examine them from a mathematical view, trying to unravel the mystery of why they appear in prime numbered years of 13 and 17. Another area of interest is looking at their nearly two million years of evolution since the Pleistocene era. At Indiana University, biology professor Keith Clay is looking at the effects of cicadas on forest habitat. Our research with periodical cicadas is uh, designed to answer the question, do cicadas have an impact on forest dynamics and forest composition. 
with the support of the National Science Foundation Ecology Program, we've been pursuing this research over the past several years uh, experimentally by manipulating densities of cicadas artificially in the field compared to areas that have the full uh, background cicada populations and ask, do these forests differ from each other as a result of alteration of cicada density? The answer to that question is unclear at, at the moment, but we're continuing collecting data and um, hope to have an answer soon. Another scientist from Indiana, Jim Spear of Indiana State University, takes a different tack at studying the effects of cicadas on forest habitat. I'm looking at the effect of the cicadas on the trees. I'm a dendrochronologist, which means that I look at tree rings to re reconstruct environmental variables. Anything that affects tree growth is going to be recorded in the trees. So if you want to look at precipitation or temperature, that's going to be recorded in the tree rings. And we can sample the tree rings, look at the ring width, and determine what past rainfall was, what past temperature was. We can also use it for ecological variables like fire or insect outbreaks. And in this case, we can look at the effect of cicadas on tree growth. And this is something that we haven't really understood very well before. Some other people have looked at it a little bit, but we haven't looked over the lifetime of the cicada to see their effect on the trees. The trees put on annual rings. Any tree in a temperate area, most trees in temperate areas, put on one ring per year. So if you look at a series of rings, you can see the rings get quite small on the outside. And if we count back, this tree probably has about 120 rings in it. So it's recording 120 years of environmental history. And we can sample that with cores so that we don't do too much damage to the trees and look at the entire history that the tree has experienced. The push of human development has meant loss of cicada habitat in new housing areas and new shopping areas. Or has it? Another Indiana University scientist, geographer Dr. John Odland, with National Science Foundation support, is looking at this question. Some of the major things we did in, in our research with periodical cicadas, which is a, a fairly small project sponsored by the National Science Foundation, was that we surveyed different environments to evaluate the density of cicadas in different environments. We went out in uh, the forests in southern Indiana and counted the numbers of emergence holes, these sort of long-lived emergence holes that they make when they come up uh, for, uh, and, and emerge. And uh, we find in forests that uh, you get an average of about eight or nine emergence holes per square meter. Uh, some places there are only one or two, some places as many as 20, but on an average about eight or nine emergence holes per square meter. That's an enormous number of animals, of course, over a sizable forest. Now, when we look at urbanized environments, drastically modified environments, uh, in some places where there's a lot of impermeable land cover, where uh, most of the surface is streets or buildings, then there aren't any cicadas at all. But we find the highest densities of cicadas in urban neighborhoods that are a few decades old, neighborhoods that were developed in the 1950s and 1960s, where the proportion of impermeable land cover is around 20 or 30 percent. There's really quite a bit of space left, there are lots of trees, and there we find on an average about 100 emergence holes per square meter. A uh, much larger number than we find in uh, the natural environment in the forests. So there's a real question about what's going on here in these particular kinds of human modified environments. And it may have to do with the way that human, or some of the things that people do when we modify the environment. We change the land cover, but we also modify the conditions for predation. And cicadas are an animal that's evolved to reproduce in circumstances where most of the adults, or a very large proportion of the adults, are gonna fall victim to predators. If we change the conditions for predation, change the species of birds and mammals that are present in an environment, and reduce that level of predation a little bit, then you get much more reproduction by cicadas. That's at least a hypothesis, that we've changed the predation environment 
and that's kind of led to a population explosion of cicadas in certain human-modified environments. Other areas of study include the fungus that can cripple or kill the magicicadas, and also trying to decipher their evolution. Yeah, one aspect of our study on periodical cicadas uh, was to look at a pathogenic fungus that's a specialist on cicadas. Um, again, one of the ideas of this life cycle of 17 years is that predators cannot eat them all, so they're able to escape. And um, this fungus seems to undercut that hypothesis. The fungus um, basically just hangs out in the soil until the cicadas emerge from the ground, and somehow it detects the presence of the cicada, and it germinates, the spore germinates, and, and attacks and infects and ultimately kills the cicada. And whether they're sitting in the ground for five years or 50 years doesn't seem to matter, that they're immune to this 17-year life cycle. And our research has shown that the fungus is more abundant in sites where there have been multiple cycles emerging in the same place. So very young forest has little, if any, of this fungus, but older forests uh, are more uh, abundant. I personally find the evolution of periodical cicada broods one of the most fascinating stories in biology. If you look at cicada distribution, you find adjacent broods four years apart. In Indiana, we find two life cycles, a 13-year and a 17-year cicada, four years apart. In 2000, we had a large number of cicadas emerge in Indiana four years ahead of schedule. And so what we're actually seeing is evolution happening right here in Indiana. Periodical cicadas are accelerating and forming a new brood. And probably in 100 years from now, we'll be talking about brood six cicadas in addition to brood 10. By July of 2004, the latest generation of Brood 10 had left nature's scene. By August, the new generation had hatched out of its eggs. Then they plunged off the branches they were born in and burrowed into the ground. Once again, they disappeared from sight for 17 years, not to be seen again until the year 2021. One can wonder what kind of a world will greet them that year, and what questions will remain unanswered about them. There are many unanswered questions uh, still remaining about periodical cicadas, and certainly uh, probably the major one has to do with the evolution of this bizarre life cycle of coming out only every 17 years. Uh, Predator satiation may favor that type of life cycle, but why 17 years? Why not 15 years or 13 years? One aspect of these life cycles that many people have noted is the fact that they're prime numbers, um, 17 and 13, but there's no 11-year periodical cicadas that we know of or no 19-year periodical cicadas that we know of. So why prime numbers and why those particular two prime numbers, um, we don't know. But those types of questions are difficult to address. They're great for uh, speculation and barroom chat, but it's hard to actually resolve them. I think the other set of unanswered questions pertain to habitat changes, long-term trends in cicada populations, and their impact on vegetation and the impact of the vegetation on the cicadas, which is something that we're trying to address right now. The pace of our lives will probably keep getting faster and faster. But for the cicadas of brood 10, life will be a constant. Knowing nature has its own clock might help us reflect on the pace of our own lives. Realizing that life is indeed all around us, and in the cicada's case, underneath us, can help us appreciate and become less isolated from the natural world.
And knowing why these cicadas live like they do may lead us to other questions in the mechanisms of nature. For in nature, as in science, there is always another question to be explored, another reason to ask why. Thank you.